Buenas tardes, friends near and far, and thank you so much for joining us for this celebration of the 30th anniversary of the community of the beautiful, that is, Future Church. The title of our anniversary event is Making Sense of 2020, Being Church Today. And many months ago, when the team asked me to prepare this keynote for you, well, the world was really different. As events have unfolded, I was reminded of when I was in eighth grade. I had only arrived in the U.S. as a refugee a year before, and I was trying desperately to learn the language and make sense of a culture that confused me. And one day in math class, our teacher told us something I found puzzling. I thought it was a traditional American saying. Later on, I found out it was just Mr. Raker's eccentric advice, which he would send out to a room of surly adolescents. He would stand in front of the class, and he would look us in the eye, and he would say with a smile, cheer up, things could get worse. Then he would pause, and he would add, cheer enough. You cheered up, things got worse. Perhaps that's how you feel today. Perhaps that's how we all feel. Yet I have held on to that quirky idea for the rest of my life. Not because I am a pessimist, which I am not, but because it reminds me that everything in life is temporary. And that control of reality is not something humans can actually do. As I got older, it helped me to see that cheering up will never be the answer to things going terribly wrong. Something new could be on the horizon that will knock us down all over again. So the only way to respond to when the worst shows up is to examine it, understand it, and work to change it. All we, you and I, have right now is the reality. And our faith would be fatally fragile if it depended on things always going right. Discouragement is something only the privileged can afford. The poor and vulnerable of the world know this only too well. We need to know it too. Giving up is not an option. Neither is it an option to sit around waiting for things to fix themselves. So our conversation today must look at our church as being in the world and for the world. I'm going to resist lamenting, even though we do need to do that. And we should make space every day for necessary mourning and tears. Teresa of Avila was right that tears are a gift of a prayerful life. So take time for the tears. But for now, because I'm a theologian, I want to invite us to do some creative theologizing as we imagine expansively. As you can tell, I am fond of the wisdom of teachers. And today, I take my cue from the great theologian, Father Gustavo Gutierrez, who says that to do theology is to write a love letter to the God I believe in, to that community I belong to, and to that church of which I am a part. A love that is no stranger to what is perplexing and even to what is bitter but a love that is more than anything, a source of profound joy. So just how do we write a love letter to God, our community and our church, while we face what is perplexing and bitter? Father Gutierrez shows us that these are not opposites, rather confronting what is perplexing and bitter in love, opens us up, leads us to more expansive views, 
And as we reach those and engage in doing the hard work of making the possible, the real, we discover joy. So let's do some facing up. I've spent many months now teaching my students through this medium mediated by electricity and computer signals where you and I now meet. And in the sorrow of not sharing the same physical space, we have tried to use the fact that we actually have no classroom walls to also explode other kinds of walls that have been built around us and our faith. What are the perplexing questions this moment is presenting us with? And how do we, together, face them, glimpse new possibilities, and work to transform them? How do we reimagine church today? Let's take down some walls. What do we mean by church? If church had an online profile in this digital world of ours, what would that profile say? Church describes itself as one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. A bunch of nice words, meaningless to many people today and for good reason. Has this been their experience, oneness, holiness, Catholicity and apostolic posture? Should we write a different profile for the church based on what you and I have observed to be actually true and not just wishful thinking? What if we do this by noticing what is lacking and what is needed, what is urgent? Will imagining an expanded identity together as we face the perplexing and bitter, lead us to that love and that love letter that Gustavo Gutierrez talks about. Let's start with the description of the church as one. Is the church as one about rigid uniformity? Is being one about the power of a male privileged minority to set the rules that force conformity and compliance on the rest of us? Is one about being the one and only to the exclusion of all others? Is the idea of being one actually a constantly painful reminder of our separations? Can we get a better identity marker than one? Imagine this with me. One color, nothing to see here. Two colors, a little more. Three, four, more. Now we're getting somewhere. Science also tells us that variety is nature's way. The natural world thrives in building up both complexity and reciprocity. Ecosystems survive precisely because differences coming into contact with each other are dynamic. And beyond science, we recognize this natural entanglement of what is different that's good because it strikes our hearts and takes our breath away. We don't feel the same under the gloom of a uniformly gray sky as we do under a glorious, multi-hued sunset. In its abundance and meeting of light upon light, the sunset speaks of the world's lushness and fills us with longing. What human making in a painting or a symphony and nature's making in butterflies Fields of flowers and bountiful creation teaches us that variety, diversity, and difference represent the abundance of life. Of course, as the church described itself as one originally, it meant unity in difference. Early Christians knew themselves many, 
often far from each other and radically diverse. To say one was to speak of the very joy of discovering that in our otherness, the power of the Spirit drew us together. <clears throat> when we encounter difference, the experience can lead us into the challenge of stepping out of our certitude and into the unknowing of what may be revealed by others. <clears throat> Churches from the east and west, north and south, try to find ways to be unified in the common bonds of baptism and experience the anticipation and excitement of letters, visits, and news from other churches. But sadly, just as soon as we started to define what unity meant, we began chipping away at it. Young people today are often disappointed to learn about the bewildering fights and separations of the Christian church. And more often than not, when we study church history, what I see in them is a profound sadness. How could church authorities so violently condemn each other, they ask? How could they question that God's love was for all and not only for those who agree with me? Who are all of these different groups today that insist on their rightness and thrive on judging others, which for them means they are the only ones defined as one? We live with a heartbreaking state of being. Radical divisiveness breeding more divisiveness by the requirement of conformity. What do you say we begin building a new pro profile for the church? Let's forget the church is one. And let's say instead, the church is encountering. The Christian life as one of constant encounter is a central teaching and hope of Pope Francisco. Even in my choice to name him bilingually, I am purposefully celebrating the difference posed by a Latin American Pope. Just in that moment between my saying, Pope Francisco, and you hearing it, something new happens, a new color, a new note, a momentary flash of otherness appears. What does it mean to encounter each other as particular, as many hued, as full of multiplicity and richness? What does it look like to be intentional about seeking the other? The philosopher Hans George Gadamer put it this way, to reach an understanding with one's partner in a dialogue is not merely a matter of total self-expression and the successful assertion of one's point of view but a transformation into a communion in which we do not remain what we were. The holiness of the church as an institution and as a people is probably one of the most painful realities we're forced to face. As we clear our eyes, we see decades of destruction uncovered, each a graveyard of lives, families, institutions, and communities. We're forced to face the truth. Sexual abuse by clergy is apparent as we sift through the ruins of what had been the unconditional trust of millions of people. We Catholic Christians have lost any right, if we ever had it, to call ourselves holy. But let me add that the idea that somehow we can claim a corporate holiness for the church, that the church as church is holy, even if its individual members are sinners, has to be questioned and questioned vigorously. 
Systemic sinfulness is just that. It is part of a system. It is facilitated, built up, covered over, and prolonged by this system. The system keeps corporate sin from being seen because it is in the very gears of what makes the system run. Sexual abuse against minors availed itself of the trappings of an entire way of life. Using the tools of trust, of familiarity, of respect, and of deference, it counted on a code of silence, on male dominance and collusion, on favors given and favors owed. As Trina McKillen's heartbreaking art installation Confess, which I experienced at Loyola Marymount University, makes abundantly clear. Just as the symbols of holiness were used to destroy vulnerable children, so must they be reclaimed, loved back into existence, and rebuilt, built again as in their defiled beauty they accuse the demonic which tried to possess them. We must first empty them so they may be filled with a new reality. As I spoke with McKillen, my heart ached as she described being a child during the Troubles in Ireland and having the space of the church building and her faith community as her only refuge as bombs exploded. Being Catholic was to be home, to be safe, to be loved, and to love. Yet as she told me with a mix of rage and brokenness of heart, of betrayal that we know so well, as the sex abuse allegation surfaced her mother, a daily communicant and octogenarian, stopped setting foot in her parish. It was her mother's pain at losing what she most loved that moved McKillen to create art celebrating the extraordinary beauty of the Catholic tradition while turning it back on itself with the accusatory cry of desolation of her mother's voice. The confessional is now glass, empty, so all may see. The chair of the priest is the size of a child who is the only one who may grant forgiveness. The kneeler's cushion is replaced by a bed of nails. The children's robes stand as ghosts. And in another room, small handmade fabric reliquaries to tears flicker as candles. Sinfulness must be spoken, must lead to reparations, must bring about radical humility and change. What kind of holiness can a community claim that has betrayed its most vulnerable? None. We can attest to nothing on our behalf. What we can do is after the destruction, when the land is a desolate waste, as Isaiah tells us, embrace our want, our nothingness, divest ourselves of power over others, follow the parables, reverse the order of the world. Because we have failed to be holy, our church must become kenotic. There is a strangeness to the Greek term, which in the New Testament is always a verb, to empty, that remains one of, and it reminds us of the one who taught it to us. Kenotic speaks of long ago, and it speaks of the otherness of Jesus, whose everyday acts were always counter-cultural. 
How often do we stop to contemplate that the church is not about itself and its survival, but about holding ourselves together in the spirit to continue to love and work for a suffering creation as Christ did. Scholars tell us that Paul wrote the letter to the young church of Philippi that gives us the theology of kenosis while he was in prison, facing a possible execution. Paul was jailed so many times that three different locations are possible. And yet, so paradoxically as to require us to pause, Scholars also refer to this letter from prison as the letter of joy. Paul discovers what wise spiritual teachers continue to teach, that when we face our powerlessness and open our hearts fully to the Spirit, we become astonishingly free. In our wounded emptiness, we make room for grace. Before he puts forward his Christological meditation on Jesus, self-emptying, Paul explains to the community, do nothing out of selfishness or out of vainglory. Rather, humbly regard others as more important than yourselves. Each looking out, not for his own interest, but also everyone for those of others. A church that is chaotic is always in the act of examining its motives, of removing any illusions of power, of becoming least and rejoicing in being the servant and giving. The descriptor of the church as Catholic did not start showing up in creeds until the late 4th century, picking up an earlier idea from Ignatius of Antioch, who used the Greek term to describe the church as both a local community under a bishop and a whole or universal community under Jesus. Today, it's likely most Catholics believe the description of the church as Catholic refers to the primacy of Catholicism as a denomination, failing to note that in the creeds, Catholic is written with a little c. It's about all Christians. It's about wholeness. The tendency to use this term to express the actual opposite of what it meant brought the Second Vatican Council's decree on ecumenism, Unitatis Redintegratio, to say that the radiance of the Church's image is less clear in the eyes of our separated brethren and of the world at large, and the growth of God's kingdom is delayed. The divisions among Christians prevent the Church from attaining the fullness of Catholicity proper to her. The church herself finds it more difficult to express in actual life her full Catholicity in all her bearings. How should we describe ourselves then as we move away from a word that has been used to stress divisions? What about the church is cosmic? In Laudato Si, the attitude of boundless and integral love toward the entire cosmos is what Pope Francisco discerns in Francis of Assisi. He describes how to Francis, each and every creature was a sister united to him by bonds of affection. That is why he felt called to care for all that exists. Pope Francisco draws a direct connection between Francis's way of living in the world as an ever-expanding love that breaks down all boundaries between all God has made and the saint's refusal to turn reality into an object 
simply to be used and controlled. In describing the church as cosmic, we also refuse to allow claims of Catholic identity to absolutize what cannot be absolute, to claim we have achieved what has yet to be, and to leave out the rest of creation. In seeing the church as cosmic, we are called to reach out constantly in search of an ever wider circle of us, which includes not only people, but all of existence. The final identity marker is the church is apostolic. Once again, in our context, this has become a site of controversy. Does apostolic mean the church traces the lineage of its most visible leaders, the bishops, to the apostles? If that is so, how can denominations within the Christian church, such as Roman Catholics, exclude women from Episcopal office since we know women were apostles, especially in light of Mary of Magdala, termed apostle to the apostles? Does apostolic mean, as Calvin stressed, conformity with the teaching of the apostles? Just which teachings does that refer to? How do we deal with all these fights? If to be an apostle, as Mary of Magdala was, meant to live in the world in the joy of the resurrected Christ and to take this joy out to all, can we have a marker of identity that is much more clearly about that in our time? Beauty, as a marker for the church, requires it to hold together the one and the many, to seek wholeness as a way to express its exuberance and fruitfulness. The church is beautiful because it is abundant, welcoming of difference, enjoying encounter, expressing itself in widening circles of cosmic usness and visibly inviting to the world. Fyodor Dostoevsky famously said, beauty will save the world. What could that mean? Beauty is visible and felt. It engenders love. It invites us to it. Similarly, the absence of beauty repels us and is also a very efficient way for us to notice what is wrong and needs attention. Beauty in its presence or its absence is an ethical marker, a pointer, an assurance of being on the right path or of having terribly failed. If we hold the Christian church to the requirement of being beautiful, exclusion, animus, bickering, blame, and all other forms of ugliness quickly become signs of abject failure. If we are to be beautiful, we must replace these with inclusivity, compassion, mercy, and forgiveness. Beauty is not difficult to spot. As the theologian Alex Garcia Rivera expressed it, Beauty must be loved to be known. Beauty will call us to it in our very hearts and ask of us love to keep the beauty alive. And when it is heartbreakingly absent, as during these moments, which will, will come because reality is reality. The heartbreak has to call us to transformation so beauty may return and our hearts be filled with love again. A church 
which is encountering chaotic, cosmic, and beautiful. How does that feel to you, friends? Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez Andre. It's um, I've been crying throughout, so it has been absolutely touching. Um, we're going to open up the uh, open things up for questions. Um, and the way we do this is I have a list of everyone here. And so as you have a question, if you would, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Gonzalez Andre, would you also unmute yourself? And then those who have a question, go ahead and unmute yourself. You come to the top of the list and I will call on you and you will, you will ask your question. Um, just as, as people are doing that, I just, we have a practice in a writing group that I belong to and some of these lines just touch me so deeply. Uh, doing theology is to write a love letter. Love opens us up, leads us to be more expansive. Our religious symbols need to be reclaimed and loved back into existence. I mean, it's just truly, truly beautiful, the things that you have uh, offered us here tonight. So I open this up for other questions. Anyone that has uh, remarks, um, heart beating fast, tears falling, whatever. So. Okay, so um, am I, am I, so is this Kay? Do you have a question? Well, you know, I'm not sure if I have a question, but just picking up on what you said, Deborah, about the beautiful lines. And one of the things that, um, um, that Dr. Um, Gonzalez spoke that really, really hit me as was the line uh, to live in the world in the joy of the risen Christ and bring that joy to others. You know, that that's, um, if I was remembering correctly, that I think you use that in speaking about the apostles, most particularly, I think, Mary Magdalene. Could you put that in the context again for me? Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that question, Kay. Um, yes, I mean, what are we supposed to be doing? I mean, that's the bottom line. It's, it's not about an institution that doesn't have a particular purpose for being. And that is to live in the absolute joy that we can imagine Mary felt, uh, Mary Magdalene felt at that moment when she recognized her beloved Jesus alive and with her again. Um, and that good news that then she rushed back to tell the others, that's what we have to be living in all the time. And, and that's why uh, I, I say, you know, if we're going to be apostolic, then we need to be just beautiful because that's the most beautiful thing there is, uh, is to live in that constant joy. Thank you. Looks like Brenda Hepler, you have a question? Not necessarily a question, but just a statement that the first thought I can came to my mind when you completed was wow. It was just almost overwhelming in a wonderful way. And I just wish we could hear more, more of Church Defined as you have spoken about it. And um, it just lifts one's spirit. And um, I would just hope that we, you record everything you say, <laughs> and we can listen to it over and over again. And thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. I'm grateful. Thank you. Other questions? How, how do you maintain your hope? I mean, what, what's your practice? I mean, it's obvious that you have a practice. It's so beautiful. It comes through. It it, it just is so inspiring. We're all feeling this weight of so many things. And I just wonder, how do you, what is your practice? How do you, how do you maintain this? How do you, 
how do you squeeze out this love? It's just so, so true. I mean, it touches so deep because it's so true, but sometimes it's so easily forgotten. Well, um, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm being very serious when I say that for me, the descriptor of the church is beautiful. Yeah. Um, I, I find such profound richness in our tradition. I mean, I, I'm a professor, so I have the amazing double gift of spending my time with all of the great thinkers of our, of our story. Mm -hmm. um, and learning from them all the time, and uh, and I'm, you know, grateful for that, and, and 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 always open to that. But I'm also always learning from my students, mm -hmm. and I I find their lives, what they're facing, their struggles, and and their courage to to inspire me every single day. I, I especially work with undocumented kids. Um, and also with our worker communities, you know, those who, as they say, clean the bathrooms and why would anyone care about them? Mm -hmm. um, and, and between those two communities, I'm always brought back to the, the gospel. Jesus was so clear. That's where he is. That's mm -hmm. where we see him. That's where God's face is showing itself to us. So if I can spend time with my students and loving them, and right now, unfortunately, it's only this way, yeah. but uh, it's still, you know, it, a source of, of profound joy. And I also keep my teachers close by. This is a picture of Alex Garcia Rivera right up here, mm -hmm. who is a fantastic theologian. He, mm -hmm. he died very young uh, in 2010 but he was my dissertation director and I, I very much uh, uh, commend his writings to you. Thank you so much. I see Rita, you have a, a question. Oh yes, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Gonzalez Andreu. Um, number one, um, could you maybe give Russ the name of that theologian who you just uh, mentioned because I couldn't catch um, how to write it down. And number two, um, I am um, committed and uh, dedicated to um, bringing more a truthful art of Mary Magdalene to the world. And um, I would love to get uh, some suggestions from you or some other people who inspire you to um, really uh, dig into the history of the art, what, what, what images really resonate and especially for young people to see this powerful first century woman who's asked to speak in public, which is um, not the norm. You know, like th there have to be, like I, there's a traditional image of her that's actually was just done in 2014, but made to look traditional. And um, anyhow, I would just love some suggestions of, um, you know, how to approach um, commissioning more work and especially work that would appeal to, um, to the young, to your students, for example. Thank you. Uh, of course, Rita, thank you. Um, well, I, I teach a course with my undergraduates called Meeting Christ in Faith and Art. And I, and I would encourage everyone who has an opportunity to be around young people to do something like this, which is to invite them to make art, to, um, to help them to bring together the tradition, the scripture, the story, and then to express it in their own creative ways. And my students do all kinds of stuff um, and surprising, amazing things. And, and most of them are not artists because this is a course for all majors. Mm -hmm. um, and I will have engineers who suddenly find that they are making a handmade book and they have learned to sew uh, and all kinds of amazing, wonderful things. So invite people to create. Mm -hmm. That is my, my, my most uh, easy answer here because people are so inherently creative. And this is how we've told our stories from the very beginnings of the Homo sapiens, right? From our mm -hmm. cave paintings from 35,000 years ago, we started telling our stories by making images. So, 
Great. And we're just going to take one more question from Jane Audrey Newhauser. Uh, hi there. I just have a, a comment. When you were talking about the question of whether the church is holy, you used a phrase that really struck me. Uh, in wounded emptiness, we make room for grace. And if the church could only open itself up and recognize its woundedness, it would be such an opportunity for life-giving grace. Yes, thank you so much for that, um, Jane. Um, actually, you know, uh, the proceedings of the Catholic Theological Society of America have my plenary address of 2018, 2018. Yeah, I forget what year we're in. Um, but um, uh, it's called Wounded Grace and the Disquieting Invitation of the Real. So uh, give uh, Russ the link to that so he can send it to all of you. It's free and, and you, get, uh, you get to read it because it is the idea that, that grace uh, enters our space when we open up to our woundedness and make ourselves vulnerable is a very important and very old concept in the church. Thank you. Thank you again. We, uh, this has just been much more than I ever expected. Uh, I'm just so touched and inspired and my heart is lifted and that's a, uh, I'm sure for everyone here. So thank you again so much for your, for your words and for your inspiration and for the beauty that you brought tonight to us. So thank you again.